Hello and welcome to another one of the Protect presentations. In this example, I'm going to be doing a, a session that was delivered as part of the 2014 conference, looking and digging into baselines and how we can use those to detect anomalies. This is primarily focused around the ArcSight ESM correlation platform uh, and how we can use some of the baselining and anomaly detection technologies that are built into it. So without further ado, let's crack on to the presentation. I'm actually going to dig into some of the baselining concepts, backgrounds, and look at and try and dig into a little bit more around the use cases of how we could use some of this to help us detect anomalies and use those to help us identify uh, threats and trigger alerts as part of indicators. We're digging into a little bit more around the tools and examples, and I, I will be going into a lot more technical detail around how we can use these individual components uh, and, and pull them together into a much more cohesive strategy. And, and then finally, I'll end up with a, a summary and, and step through things. Now, because this is a recorded presentation, I, I can't take any questions, uh, but please do leave some questions in the, session, the section below uh, this uh, video. So I'm more than happy to respond to you, uh, and we'll do so. So let's jump into the baseline concepts. What do we mean? Now, there's some challenges that we get when we have just straightforward rule-based correlations uh, that we want to look for particular threats. In a lot of cases, they can be primarily focused around signatures, focused on particular mechanisms and sequences. You do really need to know what you're looking for in advance to be able to create the rules. And as a result, are usually very static by nature. Whereas using something like baselining gives us the ability to complement those rule-based correlations. We can use changes in the behavior, changes in things that from the normal statistical average, and use those to contribute and feed into those rule-based correlations to give us better quality decisions, better quality indicators. So we're not looking for anything specific. What we're doing is looking for deviations from those baselines to identify what the anomalies are. You know, we can look for patterns that are unusual based on previously baselined performance. And those baselines can be updated as part of we're doing things, as part of we're seeing activity, as part of we're seeing log data transitioning through the system. So what about detecting possible baselines? Now, we could look to do lots of different things here. Now, we need to be sensible about the approach here. So we probably want to be focusing on core and critical services first. So things like DNS, like routing, like network traffic, where we can get data and we can identify things and we can build up those baselines simply and easily to identify what's actually occurring. So we could monitor error statuses is another good way of identifying those baselines and typically getting simple device information. So traffic going through firewalls and routers, IPS and IDS information, IP and net flow type data, even user logon data. Uh, and if we want to go into transactional systems, so banking applications and so on, the idea is we're trying to build up a reasonable amount of data. Now, what we don't mean is this is high volume data. This could be relatively low volume data, but it needs to be relatively frequent and allow us to have and create some of these baseline information over an extended period of time. So we don't want to do this on uh, something that happens only very infrequently. We want to be able to do this on very frequent data that happens over a consistent period of time that allows us to calculate this baseline data. And we can get a lot of this data from, like I say, firewalls, routers, IDS, IPS, NetFlow, IPFlow, user logon data, and so on. So those are just a couple of examples of how we could get that data. But what about detecting these? You know, what are the things we can do? We could look at this from a network world. This could be looking and analyzing network traffic that's different to the normal traffic flow. You know, looking at detecting network devices and probes and how they're changing in behavior and detecting unusual traffic volume or communications that didn't occur previously. That's very much how things are focused from a network world. But what about from an information security world, which is what we're trying to do here, which is much more focused around the indicator environment. So we want to analyze the behavior to determine the normal and then detect the anomaly. So 
things like network security data or, for example, things like user related data, logins, logouts, frequency of logins. If, for example, your application gets an average of 10 logins a minute and now you're getting 300 logins a minute, well, we know there's something unusual that's occurring. But this isn't necessarily driven by network data. This is driven by user or security related data. We could be looking at transactional data, volume, size, frequency, type, and so on. And typically things like two-dimensional baselining, so tracking pairs of information, tracking users to assets over time. So username J Smith might be a frequent user of uh, on server A, but rarely goes to server B. That kind of two-dimensional baselining becomes much more relevant in an information security environment rather than just analyzing network traffic flow from a networking environment. So think about how to build the baselines based on information security information that's relevant to your monitoring and require uh, your threat requirements specifically. So how do we respond to those anomalies? Do we want to alert immediately? And that's a good question. We probably don't, simply because we want to be using these as supporting indicators to support our further decision-making process using correlation. So we might want to, for example, add some of this relevant information to a suspicious or watch list. We want to increase the threat score of the user, the device, or the attacker. We might want to use other factors rather than the deviation from the baseline to do additional things. So put that IP address or... or um, uh, username onto a certain watch list and then have further rules triggered accordingly. We probably want to be doing some alerting on a certain threat score on that particular user if they've moved to a hostile list or that particular IP address if it's moved to that hostile list. The point here is, is that we want to have much better indicators to help us make decisions that we can then have the analyst look into when an alert is triggered, not trigger every single time there's a baseline that's changed. Although that baseline might be a critical one, we want to be involved in a much more accurate decision making with indicators that help us identify those threats. So what about some use cases? Um, there's a lot we can talk about. And here's just a few examples of some simple things that we can do where we can look at a high amount of connections or volume. So things like abnormal network behavior, malware beaconing. For example, if we see uh, lots and lots of connections in a very short period of time, that typically indicates some sort of communications application that's doing it. That's not normally a user, for example. Frequency, volume, attacks in progress. So a, a worm that's spreading is typically going to be doing some sort of network scanning on, on port activity to try and jump between hosts. A sudden number of jump in the bad or malformed packets could indicate that there's a compromise within your router and switch environment. A sudden increase in HTTP inbound traffic to your website. Well, that might include in, in, in give you an indicator of an early part of a denial of service attack against your website? Or is somebody copying a large amount of data from a system when only those services only see very limited uh, volumes of data on short transactions? What about a large number of packets being caught by your firewall's egress filters? Are we seeing a vast increased number of dropped packets going outbound? Well, that's what's that going to tell us? Well, we can start to identify compromise systems at this point. So it's baseline activity from what you see normally. Rejected connection rate of the firewall, inbound or even internal systems. What's not making it through and what is incorrectly configured, for example. Even down to network protocol distribution. Is there a particular port, service or network service that's being used that is disproportionate in comparison to what it was yesterday, last week, last month? So those are just a couple of examples from an unusually high volume of connections uh, that gives us some baselines to work from. We could look at user or actor behavior. So, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but login times, locations and applications used. So we can create those those baselines of which users log on to which uh, systems and what time from what locations. And therefore, we can have a, a statistical uh, and, and baseline to work from to identify if something changes from that. What about fraudulent activity? So monitor access to build that baseline using things like average standard deviation, minimum and maximum calculated on those daily trends. Now we're getting into technology now, but this is just an example. We could create the trends within the system and then update some active lists with the 
average number of transactions that are occurring or the the standard deviations on some of the information that we're seeing and do an, an hourly compare of the last 24 hours within that active list so what are we doing here well we're actually doing transactional volumes and whether that's going up going down changes standard deviations and so on so we can actually identify if there's an increased number of actions within the system as well yeah this this is getting a little bit more advanced but you can start to see that we can build up these baselines and use a combination of technologies within the arcsight platform to help us identify what these baselines are so let's dig into some tools and examples. Now, I, I, I will use uh, some very specific scenarios and technologies as part of the ArcSight platform itself. And I will openly admit that what we haven't necessarily done is brought together a lot of these features into a single uh, baseline or anomaly detection set of technologies. They are kind of scattered together uh, and, and we're pulling them into one set of usable sets of focused capabilities here. So that's probably our failing that, that a lot of organizations and customers don't understand that we've got these tools and capabilities and how these can be used to do some of this anomaly detection because it's not labeled as anomaly, anomaly detection. Uh, that's unfortunate, but it is there and we can use it to address this functionality. Let's dig into that uh, tools and examples. The first thing I'll pick out is what we call data monitors. Now, data monitors are, allows us to create uh, a ability to receive the data and process it in real time. And what that means is it's part of the event flow processing within the ESM correlation engine that allows you to define a module that will take and fill statistical modules with data that matches the filter and the way that you want to look at that data. So we can do things like creating average, moving average, identity kurtosis, skew and standard deviation or even variance models within that. And we can use the data that it's creating to combine with active lists to create long-term baselines. The point here is, is that very simply we can have multiple data monitors plugged in and filling that with statistical data and then we use those to trigger other actions within the system. So for example the most frequently used data model or data monitor that we can use is is what we call the moving average. It's the easiest, it's the simplest, you can create dynamic or static thresholds and it's configured to generate certain statistics on a certain field rather than the overall flow. So the idea is, is that you can generate changes to that uh, moving average for example if the threshold is rising falling or exceeding a certain number what does that mean well it means that we can we can see events classic scenario is for example logins to a particular application we can have a data flow that filters for those login events we can have that information look for a moving average and if that moving average is calculated and static, that's okay, nothing's gonna happen. But if it goes up by a certain threshold, it'll trigger a correlation. If it drops by a certain threshold and so on, you can see how this can be used very simply to create that moving average, uh, very simple baseline aspect. So an example of a, a moving average data monitor is you know, we've got a custom database by application. Uh, we're looking f and we get a normal baseline that's created statistically by filling the buckets of information with 15 logins a minute, which is the normal behavior. Now, suddenly we get a, a increase in activity of 30 logins per minute, which is considered to be unusual. So the moving average data monitor identifies if it goes up and down by you know, to a certain number but it will actually identify if it suddenly jumps up and it increases to that in fact in this case double the amount within that particular time range itself so the point is here it is the data monitor that's giving you that statistical correlation and giving you the ability to identify that baseline you don't have to define that as a rule specifically for example, we have this moving average, we can actually put that data monitor in. Classically, when customers using data monitors, they think it's just a dashboard object. It's not. And here we can see those dashboards being created and you can display that data monitor and have it used this way. But it doesn't have to be a data monitor in a dashboard directly. It just has to be enabled. So in this case, we can see that there is a, a an overall average uh, and we can see that in the graph on the left, we can see that there's a consistent average. 
and it, it comes up to an average and it maintains that average over that baseline period. So we can see there's a sequencing on that. But we can see on the chart on the right that the threshold has now been in increased, it's broken that threshold. So the average that's gone along, suddenly the number of logins per minute that's occurring has, in this case, it's over doubled. So we can see that the moving average has changed and that will accordingly generate a correlation event for that particular instance. So in this case, you can actually see the event here. Uh, it will actually generate it from that particular data monitor. You'll see moving average threshold rising. And in the two fields, you'll see the custom number one and custom number two. You'll see the percent change that's been calculated and the abs absolute change that's uh, from the previous baseline. So this gives us the identity information that we need to use for our indicator here. So we've got everything. So this is a statistical correlation. It's as simple as that. Very simple, very straightforward. Data monitors are our friend in this particular example. What about things like uh, query viewers? Now, again, you may not have realized what the advantages are with query viewers and how we can use those to create baselines. And this is a little bit more uh, convoluted, but uh, just bear with me on this as I, as I step through. A query viewer leverages a query to re generate data reports. So typically what customers have been doing in the past is using data monitors to create those particular uh, dashboard objects, when in fact it's not a really efficient way of doing things if you're not using it for the baseline monitoring aspect, for example. So query viewers allow us to just give us a data uh, in a dashboard, but leverage a query against it. But it's also got a baseline feature as well. So a query viewer uses a query to generate uh, a query on the database to give us a chart or table, and we can actually create the baselines within it. So, for example, we can actually put those information into the query viewer itself. So we can see that here we've got some data. We can actually put these into a baseline uh, and we can actually create those and for the snapshots, manually add the baseline information. We can support multiples in there. And in this example, we've got two baselines that are defined here that we want to do. But notice the snapshots can be saved as a baseline, but it's a manual process. So here, for example, we can use a, a query viewer. It runs a very simple query, gets the data, puts the data into a table, and then from there, we can just create a baseline and have that in the in the table itself. Now, that creation process and adding it to the baseline is a manual process. I, I will admit that, but it is a way that we can do that very simply and easily if we want to view that data accordingly. Here's another example looking at used ports, looking at the deviation from the daily baseline. Uh, what was it before? What is it now? And if there's a change within that. So we can look at the two baselines because we defined that in this example. We added two baselines to the query viewer for us to show that and uh, show the difference between it. So it's very simple. It's a manual process, but you can see again, we do have the ability to create those baselines and manipulate those manually within a query viewer itself. And then finally, when we get to some further tools here, we need to look at trends. Now, trends can actually leverage active lists as well. Now, trends has always been a feature that's been able to be used within ESM for a very long period of time. And a lot of customers overlook its capabilities of what it can actually do. So it was originally, trends were originally introduced to improve reporting performance rather than having to search through huge volumes of data, uh, you know, three, six, 12 months worth of data. The idea of using a trend was that to capture that information, to summarize it on particular snapshot intervals and to place it into a separate table that meant reporting on that longer term data was much simpler, much easier. So the idea was is that you'd have these trends, create them to create these long term baselines and then have that being able to use to create our, our, our way of looking at and identifying the anomalies. You need to build a baseline, and, and this is the difficulty, I suppose, that we probably didn't do a very good job of articulating how you could use this functionality to identify anomalies and, and, and use this to address particular threats. So you, you need to create the trend, build that baseline, and it needs to create it over time. So you use what we call a trend action as part of that. So the trend runs at a regular schedule, and then as part of an action when it runs, you can take the data it's summarized and put that information into an active list that allows us to track what the current 
running baseline is. So you can have multiple trends right to a single list. We can update that information as much as we need to. Uh, and a single trend can also update multiple active lists as well. Here, for example, we can see there's a scenario where we're taking some data of a customer ID, the count of the day of the week, uh, and the maximum day of the month, and then putting that information into uh, a debt credit ratio uh, for a risk. Uh, in this particular example, it's for, for a risk calculation. So we can track uh, banking customers' transactions and so on. So it becomes quite easy for us to identify uh, some overall statistical captured data and to do some comparisons upon that, uh, very simply using this trends. So think of it this way. A trend allows you to capture data over a scheduled period of time. It could be a day, a week, or a month. It then allows you to then calculate some data from the captured information and store it into the trend table, but also then to add that data into an, a list as, that you can then use actively within other rules. So the idea is this is a building block for us to calculate some information to give us some of that baseline data over a very much extended period of time. And then finally, we have something called pattern discovery, or you may also know it as threat detector. I'm not going to go into too much detail. There is another session, there's actually a training session I've made available that goes into pattern discovery in a lot more detail. So I'm not going to go into too much detail of what it does and how it operates, simply because there is a three course session actually delivered on it and exactly how it works. So I'll post the link to this in the description below as well. Uh, but the idea is, is that we can define relationships and identify when changes to those repetitive uh, changes have been made and identify source and node triggers and so on. So uh, like I said, I'm not going to dig into details, but suffice to say, the idea is, is it identifies patterns or sequences, and then you can identify that, create a profile, and then from there, take actions accordingly. So I do encourage you, if you want to know more about pattern discovery, uh, do take a look at the training sessions on that to dig into it in a lot more detail. And just a little final section on there about building baselines with pattern discovery because it allows us to do that. Uh, and there is a, a manual aspect to how you would go through the process of, of updating and, and making sure that you're tracking these, uh, these particular ones. A couple of examples of some uh, threat detector uh, patterns that it was discovered. So the sequencing of a, a, a series of events is critical and relevant because it's occurring that hasn't occurred either previously or it's identified as a particular pattern of activity that we've not seen previously. So I need to summarize on what we've talked through and what we worked on uh, as part of some of the descriptions here. Baseline really does help identify some of the anomalies here because you don't necessarily need to express them directly in a rule. Correlation rules are great, but what we do need to do with a correlation rule is work with a fixed sequence, pattern, or mechanism that's used. Baselines allow us to identify other contributing indicators to also help and make much more accurate decisions around the correlation. Things like data monitors allow us to do this in real time to look at short-term baselining. So we can capture that data in real time, even visualize it, but also have those typically used on things like moving averages to identify if something's changed in overall activities. It's a very good and simple way of doing those. Or we could use things like query viewers to do a quick comparison of much larger data on previously stored baselines. And there is a manual aspect to that, but the idea is that there is a tool available for us to do that comparisons on baselines. The much more sophisticated, but a little bit more complicated set of technology with trends and active lists allows us to create baselines for very long-term data and also with very low events per second situations as well. So the idea is, is that we can capture data, whether it's a day, a week, a month, have that updated into a trend table and then have an action where that data is then made available for rules for doing correlation and so on, becomes a much more powerful aspect to build out a much more sophisticated anomaly scenario. And then finally, we did have a very quick discussion around pattern discovery and how those can be used to build up a baseline of accept patterns but identify when new patterns occur that are, and highlight that to administrators but I do encourage you do take a look at the training session specifically on pattern discovery uh, as it goes into a lot more detail around that so that's pretty much the end of uh, my quick walkthrough and discussion of uh, using uh, 
So that ends my quick walkthrough of this Protect presentation, walking through some of the scenarios around how we can use some of the features and functions within the ArcSight ESM platform to help us identify and create baselines, but then use those to address anomaly detection uh, within and give us indicators to support our correlations and identifications of threat and risk within the system. So I do hope that was useful, and please do leave comments below, and thank you very much for your time.